Okay, well, tonight is our big night on Amendment 2. I'm going to make a few introductory remarks and then we're going to uh, go with the debate on Amendment 2. It's coming up on November 4th. First, I want to thank the uh, Athbar Foundation and the James Madison Institute for providing funding to make this possible. Now, here's how the program is going to work tonight. We're going to have our two speakers present their perspectives on Amendment 2. They each have 15 minutes. Uh, Dr. Spence will go first, followed by Ben Calera. And after that, there will be five minutes for rebuttal. And after the five minutes of rebuttal, we will have Q&A from the audience. And the questions and answers, as things are winding down from the opening presentations, there's a standing mic right there. Just, you know, queue up at the mic and ask your question. Limit it to one question, no commentary, no narrative, just a question. And after the Q&A, and that should finish up in about 45 to 50 minutes, we'll take a brief break. And the second part of the program was to be a debate between the candidates for Florida Attorney General. I thought I had things lined up, but things come undone at the last minute. But one candidate was gracious enough to agree to uh, be here tonight, not in a campaign mode, but in an informational mode. And the reason why I think that's very useful for the students and the FA community at large is because the uh, Amendment 2 raises some interesting legal questions. And let me just read, and we'll come back to this after we have our presenters make their uh, presentations. But this is the ballot language on Amendment 2. Allows the medical use of marijuana for individuals with debilitating diseases as determined by a licensed Florida physician. Allows caregivers to assist patients with medical use of marijuana. The Department of Health shall register and regulate centers that produce and distribute marijuana for medical purposes and shall issue identification cards to patients and caregivers. Now here's the clincher. Applies only to Florida law. Does not authorize violations of federal law or any non-medical use, possession, or production of marijuana. So Mr. Wolfcipher is going to address that from a legal perspective because, as we'll discuss after uh, part one of the program tonight, there's some significant penalties for possession, distribution, use of marijuana in the federal penal code, criminal code. So that's what part two is going to be about. So even if Amendment 2 were to pass, it's still illegal in Florida based upon federal law. And that does raise some interesting questions. Um, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Jessica Spencer, to my left, is a 16-year veteran in the substance abuse prevention and intervention field. She works closely with substance abuse prevention, coalitions, alcohol task forces, and youth development groups in her community. Her passion is to counsel youth who want to help others through community and public service. Dr. Spencer recently took a leave of absence from the Manatee County Substance Abuse Coalition, where she was the project director to work on Vote No on Two campaign. In her role, she oversaw the Manatee County Youth Commission and Special Projects and Coalition. She currently serves as the statewide coalition director for the Vote No on Two campaign. The Vote No on Two campaign is a grassroots organization bringing the truth about Amendment 2 to the voters of Florida. The coalition includes members of law enforcement, business leaders, constitutional law attorneys, doctors, and other medical professionals, parents, and Floridians from all walks of life. Dr. Spencer earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Tampa and her master's degree in substance abuse counseling and education as well as a doctor in education organizational leadership at Dover Southeastern University. She is a certified prevention professional and addictions professional in the state of Florida. Let's have a warm welcome to Dr. Spencer. <laughs> ben Palera, to my right, of course, is the campaign manager at United for Care, the main organization advocating for the approval of Amendment 2 in November. Is a founding partner of LSN Partners, which provides strategic counsel to clients as they manage their relationships with local, state, and federal elected officials. He also oversees LSN's grassroots and grass tops advocacy practice. Ben services clients in a wide variety of government affairs and business development capacities, 
including procurement, regulation, business to business sales, political strategy, and the planning and execution of issue advocacy campaigns. Let's welcome Mr. Polari. So Dr. Spencer, you have 15 minutes. Oh no, yeah, Dr. Spencer, 15 minutes, and I'll kind of give you uh, a little notice as time's running down. Okay, the floor is yours. Yeah, 15 minutes is it's an exorbitant amount of time, so I'm certainly not going to take that long. And it's always nice to be here at a college campus. It's always interesting because um, when I'm here, I notice that a lot of this is about the legalization of recreational use, which is I need to remind you that that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about medical marijuana. So I want to thank you all, you know, and thank you for in inviting us to be here today. I know Ben and I, this is not our first rodeo. I, I feel like he's going to be my buddy after this, which is a weird kind of turn of events. Um, and we, I think we get as many threats as by each other at this point, so pretty scary. Um, so I'm excited that people. all of you guys, what? From the same people. Yeah, <laughs> which is even weirder. Um, so I want to thank you guys for actually taking the time out of your schedule to come too. So this is wonderful, so I appreciate it. Um, I know that Ben is going to come up here and, and kind of dismiss our talking points and, and dismiss our loopholes, um, which is his job, and I understand that. But I think I need everyone to understand that this is a constitutional amendment. And I believe also that Mr. Wolsefer will be explaining that later, that a constitutional amendment supersedes all other state law. So it's very important to understand the ramifications that could potentially happen here in the state of Florida if we do pass Amendment 2. And that's part of my problem and why I left my job was because the loopholes are significant. So I'm going to go straight through ours. Um, and I'm sure some of you, if you've already gone and looked on votenotwo.org, you'll have already seen them. But for me, and the main reason why I left my job was I have worked in the substance abuse prevention and education field and in jails and detox and courts and you name it, I've done it in this field is kids. I've always worked with kids. And we are the only state out of all 23 states to put forth medical marijuana language that has no age restriction. That should be abhorrent to us because all of the other states really put in restrictions to make sure that our kids were safe. And if we're talking about medicine, we should at least have the parents involved in that discussion. But please remember that this is a constitutional amendment. So now we have kids that have a constitutional right to see a doctor and get pot without parental consent. That's concerning. If we were talking about legislation, it would be a whole different story. The other one is the caregiver, and I'm sure you've seen our commercial. And, you know, it's interesting because the other side is now getting caregivers to take photos of themselves and say, I'm not a, care I'm not a drug dealer, I'm a caregiver. Well, absolutely not, and we understand that. What we're saying is that the language is so loose and broad that it could be a potential drug dealer. It could be someone that has these criminal backgrounds because there is nothing else in the language except that they're 21 years of age. That's a problem. Even the other states, which the other side claims they don't want to look like, the other states actually have more of a restriction and a regulation on to whom can actually be a caregiver. That's concerning. Again, pot shops. We're concerned about our pill mill epidemic that we had here. Um, we had up to nine people at its height dying a day from prescription drug overdoses. Um, we were able to, working with our attorney general, make sure that those pill mills were, were shut down, um, thankfully, and we're still fighting for that. And we're still trying to make sure that people are safe in our communities. The problem with this is there is no zoning and restrictions for where these pot shops can be located. And again, go back to that, this is a constitutional amendment. It supersedes all other state law, city law, county law, any regulations that you try to put in place you can be litigated against. If there's any attorneys in the room, you understand that. Immunity was a really interesting piece for us because this is the only uh, industry that actually allows civil and criminal immunity for everyone. There's no liability here whatsoever. So if there is negligence, if there is accidents, if there are issues that happen because you have either purchased or eaten or smoked bad pots, got into car accidents, what have you, there's no liability for that. And that's pretty outrageous considering we're seeing more and more impaired drivers on the road. We're seeing more and more people going to hospitals because of these edibles. And that's frightening and that's scary. We even have some people that are admitted stoners don't even want to use the edibles because they're so scary. You also had Maureen Dowd, who is one of the most liberal pro-drug people, go out to Colorado and she couldn't even get off the bed for eight hours. These edibles are an issue. The language here says nothing about regulation and restrictions for the edibles here in the state of Florida. If they really wanted to be about keeping people safe and be for the people, perhaps they should have written it in a much, much better way. So those are concerning for us. 
you know, we're not the only ones. I, I tend to feel, and again, you know, when you can see that it's pretty stacked here today that we have two pro Amendment 2 people here, and then you have me, which is the no Amendment 2. And what I take comfort in is that we have the Chambers of Commerce that are against Amendment 2. And so if this is going to be wonderful for business, the Chambers of Commerce would have come out for it. Um, we have the Florida Medical Association. They know, and it was without a shadow of a doubt, that this is not medicine. We don't smoke our medicine. Uh, this is not the way to do it. It really needs to go through clinical trials, very simply like the Senate Bill 1030. Um, that would have been a much better way to go and look at this. It's always interesting to hear the other side talk that the Department of Health and the legislature will actually come in and fix this after. Um, they didn't trust them to do it the first time. Why are they going to trust them to do it this time? And also they're hoping that you don't understand that this is a constitutional amendment and that the Department of Health and anyone else, when they come in and try to regulate it, they can't. They will be litigated against. That's a problem when we're really looking at the safety and the medicine for people that truly, truly need it. We also have seven Supreme Court justices that came out against Amendment 2. The other side always says to, uh, they've already voted on this, they already decided on this, they've already given a decision. Well, it wasn't a decision on the full text of the amendment. It was a summary decision for the ballot summary itself, that's it. They only had to choose at that point of whether it violated single subject rule. They did not give their blessing for Amendment 2. That wasn't their job at the time. So I trust the seven Supreme Court justices that actually came in, read it, and there's plenty of excerpts that you can read from that. We also have one of the most liberal papers actually in our country, the Tampa Bay Times has recently read and written an editorial against Amendment 2. So if all of these places you know, that are actually on the more liberal side and are pro-marijuana are coming out and saying, no, not right now, not this amendment, then you need to go back and do it again. Um, my concern too is, is this really about medicine? Or is this about getting out the young vote? Um, I'm not gonna disclose what their actual theme is for their, their rallies on campuses, but it's a little bit disturbing when we're actually trying to sit here and talk about medicine and individuals that could truly benefit from what we would call you know, medical marijuana. Again, vote no on two. Um, please read the constitutional amendment. Uh, if, if anything you take away from today is please read it and understand that this is in our constitution. You can't get rid of it. It's a problem and go back and write it again. You know, I've said this to a couple of the news crews, a yes vote is for forever, a no is for not right now. I know that's way under 15 minutes, but again, that's an exorbitant amount of time. So I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, look, thank, thank you for having me here. Um, this, is, uh, this is far from Jessica and I's first time up here debating together. It's actually not even our first time debating together at, uh, at FAU. Um, I think technically the last time was Palm Beach State College, but yeah. you know, we're in the ballpark. First of all, though, what, what, what was the theme for our rallies? Because I thought it was for the patients. That's what I approved in, in all the flyers. Compassionate care for the patients. Um, was there something more nefarious that I was missing? What do you, you got one of the, here, can I see one of these cards? It's the one that goes to your organizers, not the one that you guys actually goes advertise. goes to organizers. Um, all right, well, I don't know what the organizers got. Uh, I am not on those emails. But uh, listen, I, I don't know what the hell Jessica's talking about in terms of the theme. Who knows? Um, one, so uh, first of all, thank you again for, for FAU for, for having us here and, and hosting this important debate. Um, you, you guys are awesome. I got to tell you, though, um, the last time we were here, which was, what, three weeks ago? Um, three, four weeks ago, uh, we were in a room about this size, and it was packed. Um, I know it's 6 o'clock on a Wednesday, but uh, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, you know, if, if you guys don't get out and vote, uh, she's going to win. We're going to lose. Sick people are going to lose. Uh, anybody who cares about, that's right, anybody who cares about medical marijuana is going to lose. David Tilbury down there, um, who's an advocate for the campaign, um, who needs marijuana to get through his day and, and have a normal existence, he's going to lose. Um, so for every seat that is not filled in here, it is on you guys to go out and find the people to fill them and, and bring them to the polling places and make sure that they vote and vote yes on Amendment 2. Um, listen, I, you know, I've, I've been through this song and dance with Jessica a number of times, so um, you know, I, I more or less know what she's going to say before she says it. She knows what I'm going to say. Um, but uh, let me just talk to you about some of the stuff that she said to you. I mean, the, her opposition, their opposition to Amendment 2 is based on two basic premises. Um, one, talking down to you 
and, uh, and disrespecting your basic intelligence and the basic intelligence of the Florida voter uh, and, you know, continuing to bang on this drum of, you know, this is a constitutional amendment. There's nothing we can do to change it. There's nothing we can do to change it. It is what it is. It, lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. That is simply false, folks. Uh, I was at, this is my second debate of the day. Um, I was at a debate earlier today at a Tiger Bay Club in Hollandale Beach, and uh, it was a amendments forum. So it was amendments one, two, and three, and amendment one came first, as one generally does. Um, and there were some questions about, uh, amendment one is the trust for public land. It would take some of the uh, document stamp fees that you pay on real estate transactions and put them into a, uh, a trust fund for the Everglades. And somebody asked the question, well, if Amendment 1 passes, does it just stand or does it have to be implemented? Um, and Gwen Margolis, who's a longtime state senator, was in the audience, and she said, of course it has to be implemented. Of course it has to be implemented. That's what happens. Uh, you pass a constitutional amendment, and the constitutional amendment essentially gives directive to the state legislature and whatever other, whatever other agencies are responsible for that amendment to implement the, the amendment. Um, so we are voting on an amendment to the state's constitution. Um, it is one page back and forth. I encourage you all to read it, as, as uh, Jessica generally does at these events. Um, but the whole point of the amendment is to, is to pass a law that states the basic premise that um, people should not be criminalized for following the orders of their doctors. Um, sick and suffering Floridians whose doctors say to them, uh, you should use medical marijuana. It could benefit you. It could make your life easier. It could, it could relieve some of your suffering. Um, those people should not have to go to jail. They should not have to fear going to jail. They should not have to fear arrest. They should not have to fear uh, criminal or civil persecution as a result of, of uh, them trying to follow their doctor's orders and seek treatment for their, for their pain and relieve some of the symptoms of their suffering. Uh, and the doctors who recommend their medical use of marijuana, likewise, should not have to fear loss of their medical license, should not have to fear malpractice lawsuits just for the simple act of telling somebody that they should use medical marijuana. Um, and, that's, and that's what we're trying to accomplish in passing Amendment 2. And then, when Amendment 2 is passed, um, the state is given the authority to implement the law and do it in a responsible way. And, uh, you know, by the way, I. I would ideally not want to be on the Constitution either. Um, I am a, I'm a political consultant. I've worked on campaigns my whole adult life. Uh, I am a believer in the concept of representative democracy. Um, we live in a republic. We elect politicians to lead. We elect politicians to legislate uh, and to implement laws. Um, and, and I'm not a huge believer in the concept of direct democracy, like what we're, like what we're doing here right now. But the fact of the matter is, the people that we have elected to lead us have not led on this issue. Period. End of story. They have not led. They have failed us again and again and again, and that is why we're on the ballot. Um, polls going back to 2010 have shown broad majority support in the state of Florida for the concept of medical marijuana. Uh, legislators have been filing bills in Tallahassee for years and years and years to pass a medical marijuana law. They have not gotten a hearing. Okay. Uh, advocates and patients have been banging on the doors of their elected representatives in Tallahassee for years and years and years. The doors were not opened. They did not get a hearing. They did not get a vote. They did not get their day in Tallahassee. They got nothing. Uh, and we got nothing, which is why we are here on the ballot as Amendment 2, which is why we are taking this to the voters. Okay? This is, this is um, an imperfect process for passing laws, but the reason that we are doing it is because the people that we have elected to lead us have not led. Okay, so you're speaking out. Hold on. Um, so, in the in the to to address uh, briefly some of Jessica's supposed loopholes in this, um, I think two of them, and I you only mentioned the four loopholes. I know you've recently found a fifth. Um, so, but I'll just address the ones that you talked about. I'm sure we'll get to the fifth. Um, the Caregiver slash drug dealer loophole assumes that the state will not implement this law uh, in a, any sort of responsible way. Um, they, they say they're running this horrible ad uh, that we're calling the Scaregiver ad uh, right now, claiming that uh, caregivers can be drug dealers, they can be anybody, they can be your neighbors. Um, guys, let me, first of all, let's, let's take Jessica's presumption on its face and, and say that the state will, uh, will issue no responsible um, no responsible regulations on who can and cannot be a caregiver other than 
Um, the two, and Jessica only mentions the one, there are two qualifications for who can be a caregiver under Amendment 2 without any further regulation. Number one, you have to be 20 years, 21 years of age or older. Number two, and, and really the most important one, the patient has to assign you to be their caregiver. Caregivers do not exist in a vacuum. Somebody who is sick and suffering, whose doctor has told them that they uh, can and should use medical marijuana, has to assign somebody to be their caregiver. That is the single most important qualification of being a caregiver. Um, but let, and so let's, let's put all reality to the side, as you kind of have to do to listen to Jessica's arguments, and, and let's say that the state does not issue any further regulations on who can be a caregiver, and let me run a hypothetical by you. Um, so the drug dealer, this is, you know, this is the Drug Dealer Protection Act, is, is uh, their you know, $2 million in advertising is telling us. The drug dealer that everybody's so terrified of uh, goes to the state of Florida um, and registers with the State Department of Public Health. Uh, the drug dealer, the illegal drug dealer, um, then receives a state-issued identification card, uh, which he or she then takes to a licensed medical marijuana treatment facility, which if you've ever been to a state that has uh, medical marijuana businesses, they are highly secured. There are a million cameras to go into one of these. So this illegal drug dealer who has taken it upon himself to register his name and receive an identification card from the state of Florida goes into a medical marijuana treatment facility, cameras surrounding him, uh, or her, and, and buys marijuana that are supposed to go to patients, uh, which he then goes to sell illegally. Does this sound like an even vaguely plausible scenario to anybody? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, number two is the pill mills. Uh, this again assumes the state of Florida will issue no implementing rules that municipal governments will have zero responsibility in zoning or regulating um, uh, medical marijuana treatment facilities, and it is just absolutely ridiculous on its face. Um, but again, forgetting about that, let's talk about the real problem of, of pill mills and, and why pill mills were such an epidemic. And, and listen, this is something that I've seen personally in my life. I know um, close friends, family members uh, died who have lost big chunks of their lives as a, resi as a result of addiction um, to opiate narcotics. And, most of them became addicted, by the way, after getting legal prescriptions from their doctors to treat legitimate ailments. Um, but then the ailments cleared up and they were left with this horrible addiction that they had to feed. And they went to pill mills. And why were pill mills so horrible and so endemic in the state of Florida? Because you could walk into a doctor's office, say, Doc, I got lower back pain. The doctor would give you a prescription for Oxycontin or Percocet or whatever your pill of choice was. And your prescription, you walk out of his office, you would walk immediately into a pharmacy that just happened to be owned and operated by that same doctor, and you would walk out the door with your pills. Under Amendment 2, that cannot happen. With no further rules and regulations, no fixing of loopholes, that scenario cannot happen. Under Amendment 2, you have to get, uh, you have to be diagnosed with a debilitating disease or medical condition by your doctor. Uh, they have to affirm that diagnosis in writing. They have to also affirm that in their professional opinion, the benefits of the use of medical marijuana outweigh the health risks. Uh, they have to attach a timeline to that diagnosis and that patient's use of medical marijuana. And then you have to take this written document, which is called a physician certification. It is not a prescription. Um, it, is, it is a physician certification. It is much more detailed than a prescription. When, when I get a prescription, it's usually some scrawl on a little piece of paper that is only legible to a trained and licensed pharmacist. This is much more detailed than that. You have to take this document to the State Department of Public Health and wait for them to issue you a uh, identification card, and only then are you a legal user of medical marijuana under Amendment 2. So this scenario that really caused the worst parts of the pill mill uh, crisis, which was walk into the doctor's office, walk out into the pharmacy, walk out of the parking lot with drugs, simply cannot happen under Amendment 2. And then the last two things, um, don't disrespect you, uh, I guess they, they can in some ways, but they really disrespect the Supreme Court, um, which is not the inferior court, it's not the mediocre court, it is the Supreme Court, they are called Supreme for a reason, uh, and they have ruled on this issue, and uh, while, they, while they ruled on the, the oneness of purpose of the, what they call the single subject rule and the clarity of title and, and, uh, and summary of the ballot, uh, in doing so they had to address some issues with, uh, uh, with some of our opponents' problems with what was contained within the amendment. Um, one of those things was immunity. Uh, which is what, what Dr. Spencer brought up. Uh, the immunity contained under Amendment 2 is very narrow, uh, despite, what, despite what Dr. Spencer says, and the court ruled as such. Um, a doctor under Amendment 2 has immunity for the act of issuing the physician certification. Period. That's it. That's where he gets the immunity. He or she gets the immunity for the act of writing a certification. Um, the patient and the caregiver have immunity for the medical use of marijuana. 
for obtaining, for possessing, for using medical marijuana and related supplies. That's it. Anything else is, no, is not immune. Any, any negligence, negligence is negligence, is negligence, is negligence, is negligence. And in, in crafting, in, in writing the opinion on, on immunity in the Supreme Court, what the court said, and this is, I'm not a lawyer, but I've come to understand a lot of this stuff over the last year and a half, whether I like it or not. Um, what, it, what the court said was, uh, and this is constitutional precedent, that uh, unless, a, unless a constitutional amendment specifically repeals an existing law, that law remains in full force and effect on the books. Uh, and that is why uh, Dr. Spencer's argument about parental consent is simply wrong. Um, under Amendment 2, there is no age restriction. There is no age restriction for the prescription of amoxicillin or Percocet or Vicodin or Xanax or Prozac uh, or, or any other pharmaceutical. Um, there is no age restriction under, under Amendment 2. Um, but there is parental consent under Amendment 2 because parental consent exists in Florida law and nothing in Amendment 2 repeals the parental consent laws. Okay, if, if your doctor uh, treats you, if you're under 18 and your doctor treats you in a non-emergency circumstance, um, that doctor can, uh, can lose his license, uh, can be sued for malpractice, and will not treat a minor under, under non-emergency circumstances. Uh, and nothing about that will change under, under Amendment 2. So, uh, listen, I, I prefer to be up here talking to you about why to vote yes on Amendment 2, uh, which I will do, but it's, it's easy to tell you why to vote yes. Um, Jessica and, and her campaign have a lot of uh, complicated reasons to vote no, and luckily they're all wrong. Uh, it takes me a few minutes to address them all, but they're all wrong. Uh, the reason that you should vote yes is pretty simple, though. Um, in the course of a doctor-patient relationship, if a doctor recommends a type of treatment to a sick and suffering patient, uh, whether it is a, a new diet, uh, an exercise regime, a multivitamin, or the use of medical marijuana, that patient should be able to follow their doctor's orders without having to fear arrest and incarceration. Period. End of story. Uh, and that is why you all should go yes on that one too. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Spence, you have five minutes to rebut the comments by Mr. Ferrer. Would you like to do it from day four? I doubt I'm going to take five minutes because I'm not even sure where to begin. I, I would much prefer probably to get to the questions. Um, I mean, because all I can do is just as Ben said, I mean, and again, we, I mean, you can just repeat your talking points. <laughs> <laughs> or I can just repeat yours because they're wrong. I mean, we will basically sit up here and go back and forth. There's no, no need to rebut, except I would say actually to that. Um, they, the Supreme Court did not rule on the amendment as a whole. Their job was to look at single subject rule and single subject rule yeah. only. Beyond that, that was not the scope of what they were going to be doing. So I will trust the Supreme Court justices that have come out against Amendment 2 that have looked at the entire language because that's what they were tasked to do. The, other than that, no. Okay, that's the retired Supreme Court justices were not tasked with looking at the language. You asked them to look at the language and write some op-eds against it. The Supreme Court justices who sit on the Florida Supreme Court were tasked with looking at the language, and that is what they did. And they ruled, and their rule, if Amendment 2 passes, is the law of the land when it comes to interpreting what Amendment 2 is about. It was an advisory opinion. It was not a blessing for Amendment 2, period. Okay. We can do this all night, too. We'll so. Do it. Let's get started. <laughs> Who has authority? Retired Supreme Court justices or sitting Supreme Court justices? They had authority yeah. for single subject rule. They did not give the blessing for you're the entire Supreme amendment. For your reason, when when amendment yeah, two, you're missing your, the your, your your position is that amendment two will be litigated and litigated and litigated. When it is litigated, what will be relevant is the opinion of the four justices of the Supreme Court who put it on the ballot. What will not be relevant is any opinion. Uh, of the seven justices who you trotted out to oppose it, except for maybe Justice Bell, uh, who is who is a paid lawyer for your opposition, who will probably be arguing those cases in the Supreme Court. Actually, I wasn't aware that he was paid, but all right, maybe you uh, know no, more information. He was paid or not, but he was on the chamber. He was on the chamber briefs. Which, uh, by the way, chambers of commerce do not oppose Amendment Two. The Chamber of Commerce opposes Amendment Two. It is a political organization. Well, I guess. Uh, that's it for the rebuttal portion. <laughs> That's all rebuttal from here on out. Out. <laughs> Those of you that have questions, if you want to start lining up on the, by the mic so the cameras can pick it up. And identify to whom your question is directed, if it's to vote, indicate as much. 
cannabis if the federal government refuses to change the classification of a Schedule One drug where it has no suggested yeah. medical use, even though it's proven time and time again, there's many, many legal rebuttals against that yeah. stance. How would you suggest that medical scientists go about researching this without having to wait for the pharmaceutical companies to monopolize a pharmaceutical variety of cannabis? Well, they would actually, that would be part of the pharmaceutical process, by the way. That's the first step to all of that. And, and yeah, let, let's discuss that. And we can discuss that on November 5th for sure. Right now, I'm talking about Amendment 2, but yeah, absolutely. There's pharmaceutical companies now that are researching cannabis, and I don't think anyone denies that the plant itself has benefits and has medicinal, medicinal benefits. But unfortunately, that's not what I'm here to talk about for Amendment 2. But November 5th, if you wanted to talk about drug policy and you wanted to talk about reclassification, absolutely, because it deserves to be studied like every other plant and every other medicine that turns into medicine. Yeah, I give Jessica credit because she has made this commitment before to come to D.C. with me and lobby the federal government for the rescheduling of wait, 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 marijuana. Wait, 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 we did, but wait, are you going to pay But me? in the meantime, you should vote no on two uh, so we can wait for big pharmaceutical companies to monetize marijuana. And in the meantime, people like David Tilbury are suffering and people are dying. And uh, listen, we should wait for big pharma to start making billions off of this. That's, I, that's the basic premise. I just heard a job offer, so this is awesome. Ben, we'll chat later. I want a good salary. Oh, maybe Sheldon Allison can fund us. Yeah, right. Maybe George Soros can. <laughs> Next question. Um, my question is for Jessica. Obviously. <laughs> if you have a UFC shirt, I know it's for me. <laughs> uh, concerning the caregivers, uh, mm -hmm. it sounds to me like you're concerned about these drug dealers that can go into a Anyone. certified medical marijuana shop and they can get marijuana from them and they can sell it to patients. Would you say that's better or worse than these drug dealers getting these drugs from drug cartels from Mexico and growing these drugs in their backyard? I think, I think you're comparing the same as I think they're both bad. I think at least right now in the state we have where caregivers are able to provide marijuana and actually able to grow marijuana for their individuals and, and their family members or themselves and under Amendment 2 you're not able to. The problem with the caregiver loophole is it's only that you're 21 or at least in the other states, we had some sort of thing in place to make sure that it wasn't a drug dealer, it wasn't someone that had a negative background. But uh, right now, being a college student, I can tell you what, I can find weed from anybody. I can. have no idea what the source is for this weed. I have no idea where I'm getting this weed. It sounds like to me, if they were to go to a certified, registered shop uh -huh. to get their weed, it would only lead to safer weed for all of us. Right, right. Like the registered agents that we have here in the state right now. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. What, what, what is lost in this debate is the Walgreens loophole. Uh, right now, uh, I can go to a Walgreens with a prescription for anybody as long as I have their name and address, and I can go fill their prescription as long as I have the money to pay for it and take it to them. I don't need to be 21, and I don't need to be uh, registered with the state of Florida. Um, you know, my, uh, my, my wife and I go to a, a, a small pharmacy that's a block away from my office, so she has literally never picked up one of her own prescriptions. I pick every single one of them up. Um, and, but, but before we were married, um, she went in for a little outpatient surgery, and uh, they gave her a pretty healthy prescription for Demerol um, for, the, for the recovery from the surgery. Demerol is, is an opiate. It's, it's you know, like a little pill of heroin, essentially, and they gave her 40 of those. Uh, and while she was doing the surgery, uh, we were not married yet, we had no official relationship under the state of Florida or anywhere else. Uh, I went to the Walgreens and with her name and address and a little scrawl from the doctor, uh, got a bottle of 40 Demerols. Uh, I didn't, I was over 21, I didn't need to be over 21, I didn't need to register with the state. Um, and so, uh, you know, this caregiver loophole, again, is one of these circumstances where uh, Amendment 2 is, is creating uh, something that is considerably more restrictive than what is already the law of the land um, for a much more dangerous set of uh, set of drugs. So it's uh, yet another ludicrous argument from the opposition. Next question. Uh, question is also for Jessica. Um, uh, when is it not? <laughs> Your position is more questionable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in Florida, uh, the budget situation is tight, as it is in other yeah. states. There are uh, lots of needs and too few public dollars to go around. So my question is, uh, why do you want to use or direct scarce law enforcement resources, scarce taxpayer dollars, to uh, go after patients with multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, cancer, AIDS, uh, M uh, MS, 
uh, children with epilepsy, so on and so forth, and their doctors, when those, uh, those resources could be better used to bring down our crime rate. First of all, I never said that, so I love when people always put stuff in my mouth. That's always but that's the result of your position. <laughs> it's always entertaining. You don't have um, to say it. The, the problem is, is that's simply not true. I mean, there is no one that has been arrested for having a recommendation for marijuana in the state of Florida as written by their doctor. As long as you have proper documentation, law enforcement is not going to arrest We're you. We're about Kathy Jordan. And they haven't. They were not arrested. No, no, they were not. In fact, if Robert Jordan was right here, he would tell you he was not arrested. They never took them out of them, their home. They had a knock and talk. They, they took were, her medicine. They were, right, because they did not have proper documentation. They did not have notes from her doctor, which your medical records would allow for that. They did not have that at the time that they had a knock and talk. If anybody here believes you can legally smoke marijuana with a note from your doctor, I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> I so encourage you to, to look that. up the Florida statute that allows that right here in Florida and allows no you to grow. No statute exists. Well, let's go to the next question. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Beth Ann Krug. I've had Parkinson's disease since 2009. And as you can see, I have a tremor in my hand. If you had an option to have surgery, to have something drilled into your head, put an electrode in your head, and put the other part of it in your chest. Would you choose that, or would you choose using medical marijuana to work with the tremor? Having visited Colorado, I discovered a extremely well-organized uh, place where my age was checked, and I was given uh, a combination of three different marijuana uh, species, and my tremors went away for as long as I was able to take them. <laughs> I had a brain tumor removed at Moffitt Cancer Center, so I I did make my decision, and I have a dent in my head from it. I have been in that place, and I have had a major surgery for that. Well, I'd rather... That was to answer your question. Sure. And for tremors, um, there's a culmination called Trinity. They took, they took it away. Um, when I was in Colorado, I thought about that a little bit, and I realized that surgery is supposed to be the last thing that you do. And if I can take and not necessarily smoked, because I'm not sure if that's really healthy. There's other ways. If I can take a blended marijuana, and it helps me with my tremors, and I can feel normal again. I was a teacher of special needs children for 35 years, and an educational leader as well, from at a school for the blind. So I've, I've done a lot of work to help others, and I'm a volunteer activities specialist for the Parkinson's Association. I do not represent them in my viewpoint, but I can tell you one thing that I've that our organization believes is that whatever helps the patient in a compassionate way, whatever makes them feel normal so that they can contribute as citizens of our state of Florida, that that's fine. And another question I also want to address. Okay, we're we're is, limited to one question, oh, but thank sorry. you very much. You are my comment. pleasure, and I thank you, and I wish that could be addressed. Thank you. My name is Philip. Uh, I suffer from Crohn's disease. I was diagnosed at the age of 10. For those of you who don't know, Crohn's disease is a debilitating disease, an autoimmune disease in which your immune system, for some reason, automatically attacks certain sections of your gastrointestinal tract. So as a result of this, I can't properly absorb my nutrients. I'm in constant pain. I'm in fear of eating. And uh, I have a lot, a lot of medical debt. Currently, my prognosis is to continue taking Humira which is an injection medication I have to take every four weeks. Each dose costs a little over $7,000 without my insurance that I pay $350 a month for. And um, the prognosis is keep taking the medication until it stops working, which it will eventually stop working. Currently, I've gone through every other list of medication that is possible to work for me. Um, once I am riddled with uh, lymphoma and a few other cancers that have been proven through clinical style, uh, trials and studies to be caused by Humira, and the medication is no longer working for me, I will still have to have surgery to get part of my colon removed and be pooping into a bag for the rest of my life. So my question, my, my statement is, if this passes, I will be able to move to a treatment that will not kill me by the time I'm 40. And I would like to do that as soon as possible. My question is a three-part question. It's very short. Yes, no answers for both candidates. Um, very short. Uh, one, 
is it possible to overdose fatally on insulin? Yes. Is it possible to fatally overdose on Oxycontin? Yes. Is it possible to fatally overdose on marijuana? Of course not. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, it would be nice if, like Ben Polaro, when these people are talking, that you look straight at them instead of looking down at your phone or down at the table, whatever you're looking at. You know, like, we're doing something here. This is an event about cannabis, and we're talking about a subject. Is that a question? Yeah, yeah. no, it's a statement no. of direction. Why do you wake up in the morning and do this? What's your reason? I, I very firmly gave my reason. I, I left my job because I'm concerned with the language in the amendment. If it was really about truly sick individuals and people that needed an alternative option, they wouldn't have written it the way they did. That's why I get up in the morning. Is everybody here is getting up in the morning to help people? So am I. That's Thank you. Next question. Okay, I'd like to ask both, please, real quick. Um, so, we're in this state for medical marijuana, hypothetically. What if we went back to just recreational use on everyone and then let the people, whether patients or not, medically needing their benefits, getting a diagnosis, without that, can they choose? So, back, what about changing the game? Maybe now is not the time to vote yes or no. Maybe we need to go back to where the majority originally wanted it for recreational use and get rid of all these other elements. We don't want the pharmacies taking over it. I'm just curious, because we all seem like people. We all definitely want to help people when we wake up and help ourselves. Where do you stand on the studies for these medical uses and direct appliances of recreational use, hypothetically, instead of medical? So Jessica is basically, um, and she repeats 10 times in her opening statements, this is a constitutional amendment. This supersedes all other laws. Uh, and and you know, her arguments presuppose that um, you know, constitutional amendments are passed and then they just are. They just exist uh, without any further implementation. When in fact, what happens is an amendment is passed to the Florida Constitution and then it is uh, up to the legislature um, to, to fulfill the duties of that law and to create rules and regulations uh, and legislation uh, consistent with that law um, to, to, fulfill the, uh, to fulfill the spirit of the constitutional amendment that we as citizens pass. Uh, and then secondly, you know, she, she stands up here and tries to tell you that the opinions of seven former Supreme Court justices uh, were all just private practice lawyers uh, uh, or, or relevant where the opinions of four current Supreme Court justices who actually sit on the Supreme Court, not the inferior court, not the mediocre court, the Supreme Court, are irrelevant. So uh, that is an insult to your intelligence, to my intelligence, to the intelligence of everybody in this room. And the premise of their campaign is based on, you know, you guys are stupid, you don't understand Amendment 2, it's a trick, you're being tricked by these, by these you know, evil campaign consultants who are trying to 
bring medical marijuana to sick people, it's a big trick and you're too dumb to get it. That's the basic premise of their argument to vote now. It's not medical marijuana is bad, it's that this law is bad, and, and you, the ignorant Florida voter, are being tricked into voting for something that you don't understand. Okay, I just feel like your first question. Well, that, you asked a question, thank you, because we're running out of time. One minute to the rest of the debate. Um, as a physician, medical is a funny word. Everyone gets all hyped up because it's medical marijuana. But um, I think you mentioned that there were no deaths. Every single drug has a side effect. Every drug on the planet either speeds you up, or slows you down, or kills you, depending on how much you take, how fast you take it. And there are deaths from marijuana. There are. So how many deaths are there in Colorado from medical marijuana, do you know? Zero. There are no crimes. There, there has never been in the history of humankind an overdose, an overdose death. There has never been an overdose death from marijuana, period. Please look it up. It would be groundbreaking if you could present this data. It does not exist. Well, somebody had to die of marijuana, maybe a bill of marijuana. No, someone did die of I, I still do not think that would be considered an overdose death. My biggest concern is that the presentation makes it seem that the work that put Amendment 2 on the ballot, the hundreds of thousands of people that are registered voters here in the state, didn't make this possible to have a discussion for patients to have a choice. My question to you is, why do you seem to think that it's impossible for people with that like will for the opposition to go ahead and repeal something that they equally have researched and know factual information about, that they can prove that marijuana is killing their children? And, and you're not really gonna I don't understand. I, I, like, my question is, why do you think that because it's a constitutional amendment that we can't we can't fix what needs to be fixed, that you think that needs to be fixed it? I mean, it was my understanding that to get any changes under the Constitution, there was a formula. That formula is followed. Then we have the ballot initiative. Wouldn't that be the same process to change the ballot initiative? So it's yeah, not it's called a citizen petition. It's called a citizen petition. So why wouldn't the opposition go ahead and work as equally hard on that and informing their base to go ahead and fight the misinformation that we're spreading all around the country? We're running out of time, and you've already asked the question. <laughs> Should we let him ask the question? My question is pertaining to how you feel that if this was to become a constitution, a constitutional amendment would be final, there would be nothing we can do about it. Uh, you can look up a lot of different cases where our amendments in our federal constitution have been violated left and right. They have taken our rights for illegal search and seizure. They've taken our rights and they just add different legislation on top of what's already in our constitution in order to take rights away from us. So why do you feel that the legislators can't add legislation to an amendment in order to help us out? Why do you think that would never happen? I don't feel that way. I know that way. And, and Ben likes then to say that I insult your rights? intelligence. Excuse me? Let's all just your So when you have constitution and when you have a constitutional law that supersedes all other state laws, in fact, our attorney that's here will probably be able to explain that as well. So anytime that the legislators come in there, they, you've really tied our hands as citizens to go to our legislators and say, we want more dispensaries, we want less dispensaries, we want more regulation, we want less regulation, because they can't do anything about it, because it is secured in the language, it's final language that way. If it's not written in there, and if they didn't want it to look like all of these other states that have these problems, they should have written it that way, because our legislators' hands are tied. The only way to do it is, like this woman was asking, is to go and do another citizen petition, which costs an exorbitant amount of money, which we all know how much money it costs to get it on the ballot. I don't know if that answered your question. This, this is, a, is a political argument that has no basis in fact. It is a bogus argument. And, and listen, if, 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 we had, if we had done what, what Jessica you know, claims to have wanted that we've done, if we had created a, a constitutional amendment that was a 30-page, you know, essentially a piece of statute, not an amendment, which, you know, there are differences between amendments and statute. If we had created the statute, she would be up here, uh, over there right now, saying, they are trying to shove this legislation down our throat. They're not, they're tying the hands of the legislature. They're not allowing them any liberty to implement this amendment. They're just trying to shove something down our throat that the, that the legislature did not, uh, did not have an ability to legislate on. 
Uh, so it is, it is a completely specious argument, and again, insults all of our intelligence and presupposes that, that we do not understand the fact that constitutional amendments do not just exist, they must be implemented um, by an implementing authority, whether it is whether it's the Florida legislature or, or the appropriate agency in state government. And then I will sue you because you violated my constitutional right to reasonable access to medicine or to be able to open a business where I want to. Just about every amendment in our constitution. We really don't have time. Would you like the last word, either of you? Okay, I'd like to thank our presenters. Vote yes on amendment two. Thank you for uh, the last question kind of segues into the legal dimension. Mr. Wolfsock is going to address uh, the audience in about three minutes, so don't go anywhere. You're in for a real treat to the legal dynamics, which may be the most important part of this. Thank you. The legal dynamics of this issue are really interesting, and um, especially from a federalism point of view. So if Florida were to decriminalize medicinal marijuana, it would still be, or could be, a criminal offense under federal law. And at the discretion of federal officials, the president, federal U.S. Attorney General, whoever, DEA, FBI, you could find yourself in a lot of trouble if you are in possession of marijuana, for even uh, medicinal purposes. And some of the penalties are really profound. We're talking about years of incarceration for a kilo or so, which is less than what? A kilogram is about two pounds. Um, so what Mr. Wolfox is going to do is fill questions from the uh, audience regarding, let's imagine, hypothetically, that Amendment 2 were to pass, okay? And let's assume that we have an election in 2016, or even the current administration, and for whatever reason, they decide to enforce criminal law. And even though it's legal in Florida, it's a federal offense under the U.S. Criminal Code. How would Florida elected officials deal with that? How should they? What are their options? Now, uh, Mr. Wolfsheimer is very qualified to talk about this, to address it. The bill's uh, license to practice in all Florida state courts, Florida's northern, middle, and southern district federal civil courts, Florida's northern uh, and middle district bankruptcy courts, the District of Columbia Superior Court, and the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. You know, that's quite a resume. You have to be quite accomplished as an attorney to be licensed to practice in all those courts. He's also a candidate for Florida's Attorney General in the upcoming election. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill and ask some questions after Bill makes his opening comments. And let's try to flesh out what do we do if Amendment 2 were to pass, but politics being what it is, that bring the federal hammer down on Florida. Bill? Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you right out here. I want to thank uh, the James Madison Institute for sponsoring this event. Uh, they do great things throughout the state. My home base is Tallahassee. They're very active there. And I'd like to uh, thank Dr. DeRosa. I want to recognize my brother, uh, Dr. David Walser, who is an adjunct professor on this campus in social work. And I am indeed a candidate for Attorney General, but I'm not here to speak as a political candidate, to the extent that I can avoid doing so, uh, because the other two candidates um, were able, unable to make it. Uh, the, uh, Dr. DeRosa has presented a, uh, a hypothetical, presented a hypothetical, rather hard one. Uh, it's actually, that's the first time I heard that hypothetical. Uh, so we will address that and be happy to answer questions around it. I want to give a little introduction about, um, a little bit about myself, a little bit about medical marijuana, and then uh, maybe some comments on the speakers we just heard from. Uh, I am a resident of Florida, been here since 1985. I'm an attorney, that was a career change for me, I became an attorney in 1996, and prior to that I've been uh, self-employed all of my uh, adult career, except for two and a half years as a civil prosecutor for the state of Florida. Uh, I decided to run for attorney general because I wanted to bring into the debate on Florida legal affairs some matters that were not being discussed. And I started uh, really with uh, drafting the Kathy Jordan Medical Cannabis Act, which I wrote in 2012. And 
I did that because I believe in medicinal cannabis. I believe that it is a medicine, and I believe Florida is falling behind the curve nationally uh, in bringing this uh, to the patients uh, and citizens of the state. So I sat down without pay, voluntarily, and wrote to Kathy Jordan about it. I looked what Senator Clements had done, and he had written a joint resolution, uh, which was presented in 2011 and 2012. Um, that's significant, because we're gonna discuss the law on medical marijuana and how we got here today to hear the debate that we just heard, and you don't know a uh, very informed debate like that. Uh, the history of Florida, Senator Clements wrote a joint resolution. Now, a joint resolution is much like the ballot initiative that we're going to be voting on in November, except rather than coming from the citizens, it's approved in both chambers. So both chambers look at their resolutions, say 60% uh, majority of both houses, let's put this on the, uh, on the ballot for the citizens to decide. Uh, that failed most times for uh, then Representative uh, Clements, who wasn't Senator at the time. And I took a look at that, and uh, my wife had called me out one evening to watch that uh, 60 minute segment on how well they were doing in Colorado. And I said, you know, we, we can do this in Florida. And uh, I was a member of the Libertarian Party at the time, and I contacted Normal of Florida and said, if I write a bill, will you help me circulate it? And they said, well, you know, it's going to be hard. But, uh, it's been a job before, and it's been hard. I said, well, I got a plan. And what I did is I looked at all the bills from all the states that were implemented or that failed, and then looked at the amendments that were later implemented and some that failed. And I picked and chose from all of them and put together a comprehensive bill. And I also used the knowledge I had at the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, uh, where I was a civil prosecutor on licensing issues, and thought that that would be the best way to implement a rollout of medical marijuana is uh, through uh, a horizontal integration where the Department of Health would oversee the, the physician aspect and the Department of Business and Professional Regulations would oversee the licensing and distribution aspect. So Amendment 2 doesn't look, look quite like that. I um, support Amendment 2. I hope everyone comes out to vote for Amendment, favor Amendment 2. Uh, of course, I elect the Catholic Jordan Medical Cannabis Act better. And uh, the reason for that is because of that horizontal integration, I think it's more patient friendly and it includes homegrown. In my opinion, compassionate use includes homegrown because as some of the questioners pointed out, the gentleman right here, this is going to be a very expensive product. Uh, so a little bit of homegrown uh, is real compassionate use. Now whether or not Amendment 2 provides for homegrown, uh, I don't see it in there, but some people do. I don't. Uh, I'm even aware of a uh, very prominent institute in our state who believes that the patients are going to grow and provide to the dispensaries. So it's kind of the category of, uh, of the people that are talking don't know and the people that know aren't talking. Um, I want to point out that uh, Dr. Spencer uh, mentioned a few times uh, how I as an attorney would agree on the statement she made about uh, a law being in the Constitution being more or less carved in stone. Um, I don't agree uh, with her presentation in that respect. I do as a libertarian do not like the idea of legislating by constitutional amendment. I would rather see legislative action. However, as I said, Senator, then Representative Clements' joint resolution failed two years in a row to move. The Kathy Jordan bill was introduced in both chambers, House and Senate, in both 2012 and 2013, and never came out of committee. So somebody had to act, and it was the citizens. And they did that through the signing of the petition. And this is our best option right now for Florida. Now, when it passes, and I want to bring us back to the hypothetical presented, uh, we have issues with federal law. And I'm going to keep taking it back to Kathy Jordan, and the reason I want to do that is because when I wrote the bill, it was a much different conversation than we're having today. The same thing when I advocated for same-sex marriage. I said by the time November comes around, it's going to be a moot point, and it is. The Supreme Court uh, settled that, I think, once and for all uh, earlier this week. Uh, as to, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train. I'll go somewhere else. Oh, as to the, uh, the federal oversight. When I wrote the bill in 2012, I argued, and I'm sure that James Madison too will appreciate this, that the 10th Amendment allows us to do this. The 10th Amendment allows the state to protect the health and welfare of its citizens in respect of a, a federal um, opposition. And that was a little bold at the time. But then we have what's come to be known as the, uh, the coal 
uh, memo, the Cole memo, it was a memorandum by Deputy Attorney General under Eric Calder that said, if the states that have medical marijuana laws have strict regulations in place, in other words, they're not, they're not selling the minors, they're not adding to criminality, if the states have strict regulations, federal prosecutors, our Attorney General says, leave them alone. So, good move in the right direction. Now it's going to hide the goes in the other direction. Uh, but reality right now is going further in this direction because uh, more recently, in the spring, the U.S. Congress uh, denied appropriations for uh, DEA enforcement against uh, medical marijuana facilities. They're not funding those raids anymore. And that's significant because when the Obama administration came in, those raids had actually escalated rather than declined. So we have the federal problem. One of the problems, and I guess it's the core problem, is we have a controlled substance list. And cannabis is on the federal controlled substance list as a Schedule I drug. So that means that it has a high probability for abuse, and has no known medical use and treatment in the United States. And there's a third element. Excuse me right now, and I apologize for that. Um, and the Florida Federal Control Substance List mirrors it. Now, I asked, if we have a federal control substance list that trumps the state, why do we have 51? We would just need one. But the states have their own control substance list. The Attorney General, under uh, Florida Statute 1652, has an affirmative duty to stop federal encroachment on state rights where these federal encroachment overreaches. So I would suggest where the federal government differs as to the citizens of Florida when they pass Amendment 2, that the Attorney General can respond to that. Now, when people be arrested, and a lot of people have been, uh, the pioneers were in California. Uh, they were the first to, to take this initiative. Many of them lost their investments and lost their liberty. Uh, that, that has evolved. So I think the risk is lower. Uh, however, um, we're going to get a new administration in 2016, and there's, there's really no telling. Uh, personally, I think it's going to be a, a moot point as well by 2016 because the, um, the nation has, has spoken as a nation and they want to see this medicine available for the patients who need it. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity to debate with the two other Attorney General candidates on Monday, and Attorney General Bondi said repeatedly that we will have pot shops on um, every corner in every city. And I heard uh, Dr. Jessica Spencer uh, say something very similar and that, um, you know, minors will have access, and what do we do about that? Well, that's where law enforcement comes in. There's going to be laws, there's going to be regulations, and I, uh, I, I think that the federal government will respect that we have to take a chance, but that where we have laws that are implemented, we can maintain our state sovereignty. Now, that's called nullification. And when you say nullification, people start thinking of, uh, you know, the, the predecessor to the Civil War in our country where, uh, you know, South Carolina wanted to nullify and succeed from the Union. But we have nullification all over. Uh, we have states that are not adhering to national gun rights. We have states that have uh, denied same-sex marriage even before DOMA was overturned. That's nullification. That's when they say not in our state. You've got a federal law, but not in our state. At the same time, we have to remember that we're part of a union. We're not a sovereign state. So there's, there's a, a balance there that needs to uh, be reconciled with. Uh, there are other laws. There are other laws. There was a recreational bill by Senator Bullard, which was uh, 21 and up, straight out regulation, uh, recreation. It put, uh, it created the alcohol, beverage, and marijuana um, agency within DBPR. And it essentially uh, said, let's control marijuana like we do alcohol. And the state does a wonderful job at that. And I pointed that out to Attorney General Bondi the other day. We're not gonna have pot shops, put a pot shop is on every corner, and and 12-year-olds overdosing on marijuana, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Even though we have problems with underage drinking, um, we're always going to have problems. We're not going to solve all crime, uh, but it's certainly a move in the right direction. I caution some of the conversation we heard tonight about going straight from the Constitution to law. Uh, we still have a legislature, and we have the Department of Health, and this amendment, too, allocates rulemaking to the Department of Health. Now, my interpretation, is that it can go right to the Department of Health, they can implement rules, and then the legislature can approve, repeal, confirm those rules. They have the final say on whether or not those rules meet their requirements. Uh, the role of the legislature following the constitutional amendment is somewhat limited, they still have a role, 
but it is, it is going to be somewhat limited by the parameters of the amendment. Um, I can, I think I have more, I know I have more to say, but I think I'll do it in a question and answer format. Uh, I think that's what is uh, called upon us here. So, yes, uh, Jan, Ben, 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 Nonsensical. Uh, there was a mention by Mr. Plower of whether or not we have uh, an allowance in our state for medical marijuana just because there's physician approval. Uh, no one raised their hands and said, no, we don't. And uh, that's correct, but there's another step to that, and that is physician approval approved by a judge or where the local prosecutor or sheriff agrees to recognize that. So we do have, under the Jenks ruling, a right of self preservation where the court found that. Your, your liberty right to preserve your life outweighs a violation of law in some cases. And in that case, it found out that it did, and of course, the, the, uh, the caregiver was a spouse. Right? It, it wasn't any uh, learned professional. And I think the caregiver is often a spouse because it's a very personal thing. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the opponents uh, are sincere in their opposition. They, they've grown up through an era of bad information, and, and they're relying on uh, old accepted norms that have been disproven, yet they still rely upon them. Uh, go back to the hypothetical, what would it do with the federal government when they say you cannot do that in Florida? Well, first thing we do is show them the 2003 patent which finds that marijuana has uh, medicinal value. In the patent, we make claims. And you say, what does this patent do? And this is, of course, the medicine. And the federal government binds on their patent that it does indeed have value. So one may say, well, how do they enforce it when they have the patent? And the federal government's response is, uh, it's a different division of the uh, federal Leviathan. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I feel like people are probably a little more interested in marijuana question and other than the federalism question that I'm interested in the federalism question. Uh, and uh, so the, the hypothetical brought up basically the, the tension between the supremacy clause in the federal constitution, right, that, uh, that says that the federal constitution trumps all, and our own amendments of the state constitutions in Colorado, Washington, possibly in Florida, or and so on. Um, it seems to me that the that the way this gets set up, though, is sort of like a, a heads I win, tails you use, right? So from the Wicker versus Filburn case in 1935, the, uh, you know, the, the farmer said, uh, uh, said, listen, you can't, you can't regulate my, my growing of wheat. It's for my family. And not, I've done nothing that does interstate commerce. The federal government has, can't do anything about this. I'm in Ohio leaving alone. Uh, the court disagreed. Uh, the court had a chance to overturn that with regard to marijuana with, in Gonzalez versus Branch in 2005. Uh, the supposed constitutional originalist Judge Scalia said, you know, all of a sudden his uh, originalism suddenly fled his, uh, he, he saw that Wicker versus Coburn was good law, was precedent. Um, and so it seems to me that there's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to win, which brings up the slightly second part of my question, which is, the only thing that all three of you agree on, uh, Dr. Spencer, Ben Polara, and you seem to agree on, is that you don't like uh, you don't like direct democracy governing by constitutional amendment. My question is, why not? Uh, the Congress has a sub 10 percent approval rating. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing gets passed. Uh, bad laws don't get overturned. Oh, unpopular laws don't get overturned, or, or popular laws don't get passed. What's wrong with a little more direct democracy going? Thank you. I get three questions. <laughs> One about the supremacy clause, uh, then about uh, interstate commerce in relation to uh, the federal government's uh, heavy hand, and then uh, what's the matter with ruling by constitutional amendment? 
the first one, if anyone's not familiar with the, uh, the case the gentleman was referring to about the wheat, a uh, farmer was growing wheat for his own family's consumption, and uh, the federal government and the court found that that interfered with interstate commerce, even though it was not leaving uh, his family's, let's say, farm or kitchen, uh, under the uh, suggestion that if they're consuming it, someone's not bringing it in from out of state. Uh, took that into consideration in the Kathy Jordan uh, Act and uh, specifically put in there that that was going to be an in-state cultivation and in-state in -state, uh, dispensing to try to over, you know, to look ahead about the federal government. I point that out because there's problems with the proposed Constitutional Amendment 2 that, um, and as much as I'm in favor of it, uh, it does have uh, concerns. And one word says the dispensary can acquire, and that word acquire tells me it can come in from out of state. And that does invoke the interstate commerce clause. I think the word acquire also means it could come in from uh, foreign countries. Uh, so that word acquire bothers me. I kind of wish that was not in there because uh, we, we want to keep the federal government as far away as we can from our state's constitutional amendment. Uh, I do not agree with you that the uh, federal government supremacy clause controls all constitutional amendments. Uh, it did in the, uh, in the Windsor case with regard to same sex marriage because that was decided on the Fifth Amendment under equal protection and the Fourteenth Amendment uh, incorporates the Fifth Amendment as well as others. But the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, portions of others, are not incorporated. So to the extent that we can argue that the uh, medicinal marijuana law is a petition by the people under the Ninth Amendment, which is not incorporated through the Fourteenth, we, we can overcome that on federal sovereignty, supremacy. And the third question was? Uh, what's wrong with the... Uh... Regulating by... I, you know, as, as a libertarian, I, I believe the Constitution should say we should have uh, three branches of government. Here's how you elect them. Here's when you have your elections. One, 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 one quick question, real quick. Uh, so the head of the, the marijuana part, the Washington State Liquor Commission, uh, public policy guy from UCLA, his name was Mark Klein, he said, look, we can square the circle with the Controlled Substances Act, the federal act with three schedules that has marijuana as dangerous as government system. The federal government can make side agreements with the states and, and promise not to prosecute Washington and Colorado, um, and then you don't have to have this problem with the federal constitution that's almost unamendable. Uh, are you okay with that? Side agreements? Yeah. Um, uh, um, I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question, um, so I, I don't want to answer the wrong question. Can, can you rephrase it a bit? Uh, so it would be like the like the Cole Amendment and the Opt Amendment, which were basically the letters put out by the Justice Department right. where it said the conditions under which it would right. be prosecuted, they um, would make that, give that the, the power of law. Okay. Uh, and if that becomes the power of law, then uh, that would probably have to be through most of the Congress. But, but let, me, yeah. let me address this question because okay. I'm kind of chomping at the bit. Okay. And the question was, what's wrong with direct democracy? Here's what's wrong with direct democracy. You could have majority tyranny. And one thing the debate and the discussion tonight is we're all taking as a given the government has any business telling us what to do, period. I mean, when you think about in, the, the part of the program is individual autonomy. Why can't individuals choose for themselves? So you could have uh, petitions, plebiscites, uh, constitutional amendments, but that's not a panacea. The majority can be just as bad as the minority. And the problem's not who's making the decision, but the decisions are being made in government, which, quote, has the legitimate use of coercive force. That's the problem. The fact that we're sitting here and have to jump through all these hoops, jump over all these hurdles, because we have governments, and that's the federal, not only state, but federal, local, and everything else, we need to look at it from the perspective, why? What's government? It's people, it's stakeholders. And both sides of the debate, and I was going to bring it up, there are stakeholders that their window dress up, marijuana is bad, marijuana is good, medicinal marijuana is bad, medicinal marijuana is good. But there are players behind the scenes that will profit on either side of how this comes out. So try to think outside the box. And, the, and I, my suggestion is, by what authority does government have to push us around like this?
Yes, sir. I just have a question on how you believe this law will be implemented based on the fact that it's a constitutional law. Uh, I would ask if you could probably equate this to the Second Amendment, amendment of the Federal Constitution, which is the right to bear arms. In that amendment, there is no age requirements. There really isn't many requirements at all. However, as a five-year-old, I can't walk in and buy an M80, and me being right now, I'm not registered to buy a concealed firearm. So even though that language isn't in there, you can still put in that legislature. Do you believe this will be treated the same way? Oh, the analogy with the Second Amendment is a little rough because the Second Amendment has the word shall, uh, shall not be infringed. And we get into the question of where does regulation cross the line and become infringement. But I'm glad you're, you're up here because of the comment you made before. And, and, uh, and I like what the uh, professor said about thinking outside the box because we've got to look ahead. If Amendment 2, when Amendment 2 passes, I will say if, when it passes, the DOH is going to be the rule makers. Again, we're going to go to the legislature and approve those rules. But the people in the Department of Health are the same people that just made the rules for Charlotte's web bill, SB 1030. And they treated it as if, you know, I went to uh, two out of three of their workshops, I went to their appropriations workshop, and then I went to their um, rulemaking workshop, two of them. And they were discussing handling uh, the cannabis plant as if it was nuclear, <laughs> as if it was radioactive. I was waiting for them to say that you know, the nursery men have to wear hazmat suits. <laughs> and these are the same folks that are going to be making the rules to roll out uh, Amendment 2 when it passes. Now here's the problem. The Department of Health is part of the executive branch. And the executive, I believe, I don't know for sure because Governor Scott doesn't talk to me, but I believe that he's instructed them not to answer the question of where does that first seat come? And that's why I'm thinking of you. Because you said, as a college student, if I remember you're the right gentleman in the line, uh, you know where to get it. Now, the Department of Health clearly said they're not going to authorize the first seedling or the first plant into the state. So they've got a plan. They're allowing five nurseries that have uh, 30 years in business, continuous, which means that they had to outlive hurricanes. Uh, there's very few that fall into that. So there is certainly a, a small group of people, I think that might have been suggested, um, that have a huge cash incentive uh, in the way this rolls out. But I also have to point out that when they passed SB 1030, they violated the Federal Controlled Substance Act, which says that there is no medicinal use for cannabis. Now that's already been violated in the state of Florida by passing 1030. So in the debate Monday night, I pointed out to our Attorney General that she has a thorough list of duty for not removing cannabis from Schedule 1 contemporaneously with the passage of SB 1030. Because we can't have a law in Florida that says, well, all right, you know, up to, up to um, 8% and more than 10% CBD has medicinal value for certain patients under certain guidance. Okay, limited, acceptable, but it's got to fall off the schedule one. You can't have the two. Or else our physicians will be uh, in jeopardy and, and our patients will be as well. So add to that that we still know where the first seed's coming from. Add to that we have a limited, and, and this is going to roll out before Amendment 2, so I really think not to be partisan, but I think the Republican majority put this out there as a predecessor to either lay the groundwork for Amendment 2 or to have the people say, we don't need Amendment 2, we already have a marijuana bill. Many people have said that to me. Um, so it, it, it is laying the groundwork and it doesn't look good. So we still have to rely on, on, our, uh, on our government to implement this. Hope that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So could I ask you a quick question yes, about the uh, money laundering aspect in the federal <laughs> Uh, banking laws, we see that that's, a, in other words, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and if they want to, in some way, curtail the positive effects of Amendment 2, um, they could do it through regulatory policy, administrative law, at the federal level, that's really behind the scenes and sort of under the radar. So as, as Attorney General, Peter Rowe, the Attorney General, member of the Florida Cabinet, is confronting those types of maneuvers on the part of those who want to uh, minimize and marginalize the effects of what Florida, Florida is intended by passing something like that. Yeah, and the, and the banking financial aspect is a big problem. And I, and I know there's been some banking, oh, BSC, Banking and Securities Act, to try to allow, uh, give allowance for banks to invest in the marijuana business, and so in the high risk ones will. High risk means high return for the lender. But um, even 
even when that is, opens up, it's going to be hard to get investment because investors don't want to risk losing it because we still have this, this federal state dichotomy. Don't know why, because so many states have already gone uh, over and uh, reneged on the, the, that supremacy, that perceived supremacy. So as Attorney General, and as a cabinet member, we're also sitting on a clemency board, and that's another point we can touch on. Uh, I would do all I can to protect the lending institutes so that they can participate in this industry. Now under SB 1030, they set a minimum uh, financial wherewithal to qualify to be an applicant in a lottery. And of course that's already been before the Department of Administrative Hearings about whether or not the lottery is even permissible because that's, the law doesn't mention the lottery. But the concern there is if you can't demonstrate financial ability to carry this for two years, then you don't apply because we know the banks are not going to fund you. So I, I think if I understand the question uh, correctly, uh, we want to see uh, commerce in our state. We want to see this market grow. And as in any market, you've got to make money available for the uh, entrepreneurs to engage in it. Yeah. OK, uh, I wanted to point out Pearl Dickey's in the crowd. He's a real accent to Palm Beach County. If you haven't had a chance to meet Pearl, perhaps he has a few minutes afterwards to uh, chat with you about some interesting public policy issues here locally. Um, I think we're going to have to vacate because of our time for paying for this building. So I really want to thank you. Bill. That was really interesting. And you can keep all these writings online.